Hello everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay. We've had a very slight major technical difficulty, but we are getting through. Uh, I'm Kyle with Andrew Hilton. Uh, you may notice that my shirt is actually cross-buttoned because uh, about three minutes to air, uh, my headphones died. Um, so as a result, I had to sprint over to the gas station and buy gas station headphones, and that's what we're going with at the minute. Uh, and they work exactly as well as you would expect gas station headphones to work, which is to say not desperately well. Uh, tonight we have four whiskeys. These are from the Hunter Lang catalog. Uh, we have whiskies from Old Malt Cask, Scarabus, uh, and these guys also do, like, they do so much. They do Hepburn's Choice, they do First Editions, they do the Author Series by First Editions. Uh, they, of course, are the folks behind the Ardnaho Distillery. They do so, so much. Uh, and we're going to be joined by two guests tonight. Uh, not only Lee Hansen, who's, of course, a friend of the program, we've had him on once before, uh, as well as uh, Andrew Lang, whenever he, uh, we get the technical side set up for that. So, Lee, how are you? I think we lost Lee. Uh, he's, yeah, it's a little sluggish. Try again. Uh, Lee, how are you? We have nothing on Lee. Great, so this is going tremendously. Um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, we've now lost him entirely, so that's good. Uh, yeah, so let me talk a little bit about um, what we've been dealing with here. We, uh, we are dealing with the world's worst Skype reception what, uh, in the history of everything. Uh, we this system, let, let, let's just be clear, has worked brilliantly through 28 weeks of beer tasting, through a whole lot of different wine tastings. Uh, it's just tonight, everything that we had vetted and like tested time and time and time again, and everything was like thoroughly vetted, worked every time, everything was super good, except color balance. Tonight, absolutely every single system we have from video to audio decided to spontaneously die on us. So isn't that fun? Uh, so I had actually planned on having two special guests tonight who would know a great deal more about the whiskeys than I do. So I didn't actually do all that much research into what we have tonight. So that's great. I do know what we have in front of us. So let's get whiskey in our glasses while Aaron like frantically fights to try and get us literally anything that works whatsoever. Uh, we are going to be starting with the Fetter Cairn... 11 year. Now, if I'm wrong and it's actually a different age of Fetter Cairn, I apologize. It's been a hell of a night. Uh, now, Fetter Cairn is really, really well known for making whiskeys that have this kind of freshly shaved wood and graphite aroma to them. I always think of them as being almost like pencil shavings as your dominant aroma. Um, and I really get that immediately here. I get a lot of fruit here. I get apples, I get pineapple, I get citrus. I get something in like key lime, almost into um, I'm trying to think. Those little tiny mandarin orange things. Those are uh, those are kind of what I'm going for. But with everything that's happened tonight, I am not uh, not picking up on what the heck those are. If someone remembers what those are, they could really just bail me out here. Um, so. Do I have the history on these? No, I don't, because I had Lee Hansen and Andrew Lang until about three minutes ago when everything exploded. So I do apologize. I normally have a lot of preparation and notes done on these, but uh, tonight I don't, because I thought we would have, you know, guests like Lee Hansen and Andrew Lang. Um, okay, so let's just power through. Now, on the nose, yes, we get that tropical citrus. We do get the bright fruit. We do get kind of that pencil shavings aroma. All of the old malt cast stuff where possible is bottled at 50% alcohol, so it's not cut right down to 40. And all of these are non-chill filtered and no caramel addition. Clementines, thank you so much. Yes, Satsuma would have been a really good answer. Chris, you nailed it with Clementines. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Uh, oh, hey, we have Lee. Uh, we had Lee. We had Lee for about five seconds. Uh, that's good. Uh, so, yep, keep going. so Lee, do we have you at least for audio, if not video? Yep. Okay, wonderful. We we have very little of you, but you have us. So that we're, that's better than we were five minutes ago. Uh, we are going to start with the Fetter Cairn tonight. Lee, why don't you walk us through the Fetter Cairn, where it comes okay. from, what it's about, and what you think it tastes like? Fetter Cairn. So fantastic. St 
Fantastic um, distillery to work with. Lots of great history here. We're looking at an Eastern Highland whiskey. Uh, some of the fun beats. The um, the founder lost his shirt within the first year. The uh, the distillery <laughs> was how to lose money. Started a distillery, but the. Um, uh, it ended up being taken over, and uh, sorry, what the name is the uh, the Gladstones took it over. John Gladstone took it over, and then years later, his son William Gladstone became prime minister and brought in sweeping reform on whiskey taxation, which enabled it to be, just blow up. It became this huge thing. Um, distillery offerings you don't see a lot of them uh, in the Fiore and Fauna series. Uh, you'll see occasionally a 21 year old um, on this particular whiskey. It's a beautiful sherry cask. Um, I get a lot of the kind of sultana, raisiny things going on there, in addition to a little bit of citrus notes. And there's some fun, uh, darker notes here, some uh, some texture, a little bit of coffee. Wonderful uh, amount of plush. Uh, texture from that uh, from that Spanish oak influence there too. You don't have to be super old. Do we know where that's coming from. When you've got a really reactive cask. Now I'll pour myself some. <laughs> Lee, do you have your phone like close to your uh, to your computer? We're getting some feedback. We're not sure if it's on your end or our end. Okay. Normally I mean, we'd uh, be able to nail that down, but nothing works tonight, so we're just kind of fishing at this point. <sighs> Hey, how about how about now? Yeah, it's clear now. We're good. Okay, okay it must have been my. You're right. My phone was sitting right there. So I'm gonna. It was sitting uh, right there. Okay, that, that's little. exactly what it was. Then we're good. So, Federkern, not something not we right. see very often here. Uh, not something that we get a lot of. There's really no. I mean, there are occasional flora and fauna series offerings. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the flora and fauna series. We don't see that much here. We get far more of like the classic malts of Scotland. Um, I've seen some of the flora and fauna, like we get the Kleinlish here a little bit, but it's not something that's really a North American thing, it's far more a UK thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they look after their uh, their home market, of course. Uh, and I do remember when those have come over, they've been dreadfully expensive. So uh, it, it might be a taxation thing that by the time they get here, they're just so, so high, highly taxed, excise on the way out of the country, excise on the way into the country. Um, could be just good old-fashioned greed. Uh, I think we have an infinite loop of Lee Hansen going on just at the minute. Um, so we'll just let that clear up for a second. Yeah. Curious what everybody else is thinking on this one. And thank you all for bearing with us. We've actually had really good luck through all of this until today. Um, yeah, so <sighs> sorry, I'm still a little rattled about all this. I do apologize. Okay, uh, we had someone ask what the old malt cask series is. So this is what we call an independent bottler. So old malt cask doesn't own Deanston, they don't own Daluin, they don't own Fettercan. There very often are uh, distillery bottlings of these distilleries, um, but they aren't always um, things that we can get here in North America. And in some cases, uh, these are not distilleries that actually do in-house distillery license bottlings at all. What a bottler like Old Malt Cask, uh, and many of the, uh, the Hunter Lang author, uh, offerings are between like Hepburn's Choice, First Editions, the uh, author series, all of these, uh, and they have a single grain series as well called Sovereign, I think, uh, not one we see very often here. But effectively, these are people who are interdicting kind of partway through the process. So they didn't make the whiskey, but there's a distillery out there who makes a whiskey that they bottle at about 12 years old. I won't say which one it is because we do actually sell it here. Uh, but I think the 12 year old historically was one of the worst whiskeys in the world by the time it got here. It was 40% alcohol. It was super heavily caramelized. It was artificially colored. You could tell the whiskey was trying so hard to be good, but it was so heavily screwed with during its bottling and its production that nothing could really shine through. Now, that distillery's independent bottlings, be it from uh, Lang or in the old days, uh, Mary McDavid or whoever, um, those bottlings actually had incredible purity and power and cleanliness. So what these guys are doing is they don't make the whiskey. They step in by a barrel. They age it themselves and then they finish it themselves generally to a higher standard of quality than the distilleries themselves do. 
Now, that's not to say that like Edredur is doing a whole bunch of caramel addition or they're chill filtering their whiskey or they're artificially coloring it or they're cutting it aggressively. No, Edredur is doing a great job, which is part of why you don't really see a lot of independent Edredurs. They're doing fine on their own. Where we do see very often these step in um, is distilleries like, I don't know, I don't want to pick on anyone, but let's pick on Glenlivet because they're convenient and I just happen to see them sitting there over on the shelf. Um, you know, Glenlivet has really cleaned up their game. I, I think the new 12 year, what are they calling it now, double oak, uh, is significantly better than the old 12 year. Um, but let's be fair, for a very long time, the Glenlivets you got from independent bottlers tasted like something and the distillery additions really didn't. So that's what the uh, the whole Douglas, or it's probably Hunter Lang, I'm going to make that mistake at least twice more tonight, Hunter Lang Old Malt Cast Series um, is really all about. It's delivering better whiskeys to different markets than, uh, than what the distilleries do. And the other thing that Lee actually pointed out when we were talking about the Flora and Fauna series is a lot of the Diageo distilleries or DCL distilleries like Kleinlish, like Fetter Cairn, like probably 25 others uh, that aren't in that classic malts of uh, classic Malts of Scotland series like Oban, Craig Ellicky, Dal Winnie, uh, Talisker, and Glen Kinchy and the one I didn't name. Um, those really are what they focus on as the North American bottlings. The other ones, you know, they're designed for European release. So they might do a distillery edition of Federcairn, just not for North America. And that's not just true of Diageo, that's true of many, many distilleries. And that's why I really value these independent bottlings and why, you know, when I took over the whiskey section like 15 years ago, I really started focusing on them as it's like, this is what you're supposed to get. Please be satisfied with it. But there's this whole other whiskey world that's happening in the background that, you know, as North Americans, we're not even supposed to be able to access. And yet independent bottlers are bringing that to us and creating something different for us. Lee, do we have you back? I have your video back. Uh, okay, uh, I can hear you now. You were a little bit choppy before, but now uh, now I've got you back in. I'm just chatting with Andrew, trying to get him uh, in on the call. Um, yeah, nothing is going to fix all our problems, like adding one more <laughs> Skype line. Uh, but yeah, exactly. uh, so I'm just going to quickly cut through a couple of questions here real fast. Um, just going to quickly, uh, how do you taste scotch? Actually, Lee, I'll flip this one over to you. This is actually a better question for you than for me. What is the correct method for tasting scotch? Uh, when I taste, uh, I treat it like the other distillate in our lives, uh, perfume or cologne. Uh, a little goes a long way. We just need to just touch the tongue. Uh, these particular whiskeys, all the old malt casks are in at 50% alcohol. So, and with the no chill filtering, no caramel added, natural whiskeys, my opinion require a touch of water but i of course uh always advocate to taste it first uh when i do add water i mean just a touch let's see if you guys can see this i, I love that you were um i use uh a mineral water and i just poke a hole in the in the lid you can see there and then i get a fairly precise measure i just need a drop to activate and once i've activated the uh, the oils that we leave in then i've got a true um representation of what the uh what the whiskey is going to taste like a little pass under the nose not something we have to do a big swirl on like we would in the wine uh with the wine tastings just a nice little pass it's already volatile enough to get up there I immediately start to go to uh, descriptors and flavors now. I'm getting like some coffee notes on here, some woodsy stuff, um, a little bit of a berry. I really struggle with getting coffee out of whiskey. It's something that I can be very perceptive to in wine, but in whiskey, I just don't get it all. Uh, for any of you wondering why I'm pinching my shirt, there's actually a button on these cheap gas station headphones that I have to push to actually be able to hear Lee for the most part. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I should point out something unique about uh, about this Fetter Cairn as well. In addition to it being a very uneven age, 11 years, this was bottled at 11 years old because it was ready. Um, but one of the neat things about this is this is actually from a, uh, a refill sherry hogshead. Now, typically when we say sherry, we're talking about a butt, which is a much yeah, larger. Yeah, I was wondering era. about that. Yeah, so what it is, is it's a uh, bourbon barrel that has been seasoned for the whiskey business. Uh, it always was intended to go to Scotch whiskey, but they've used an old bourbon barrel, or a, I'm sorry, a new bourbon barrel, and seasoned it with sherry for our purposes as independent bottlers. 
So it's kind of neat. It's a 250 liter, so you've got a higher wood to whiskey ratio, which is going to give it much richer contact than a 500 liter butt wood. Okay, I got Andrew coming in right, right away. Um, and so that is one of the reasons why we can bottle this younger, because it's getting so much more texture and exposure to the, uh, to the wood. Beautiful. There we go. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm, we're so close to having Andrew on here. There we go. That's all right. We're, do we're doing fine. Well, I got him out of bed. <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. He wasn't in bed. There we go. Hello, Andrew. Hello, hello, Carl. How are you doing? How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Sorry for the technical problems I'm having here. No, no. Trust me, we're we're well acquainted with technical <laughs> problems tonight. Uh, how have you been? How's everything with you? What's yeah. news? Pretty good, thanks. Pretty good. It's, uh, you know, we're pretty used to being locked down here now. Um, Luckily, people are still drinking whiskey, so that's the the main thing from a business point of view. And I, I hope the same goes for you on your side. Uh, honestly, it's been a pretty amazing week. I'll be very honest. We've sold a lot of whiskey this week. Um, now, I was going to do this big uh, fancy introduction, and then it, we kind of let it get away from us. Uh, why don't you tell the people who you are, what you do, and why you're the one telling them about these scotches? Okay, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> I can see you're standing in your your emporium there. Um, I hope that some of uh, the people on the call with us, how many people are, are on, uh, by the way? Uh, I've got 20 live viewers, uh, which probably translates to about 45 people, because most people bought it to share. So we probably have 45 to 60 would be my bet, because wow. yeah, I, I know of at least uh, three people who bought it as like a group and are watching like three, four, five of them at home. So I'm showing 20 viewers, but I bet we got about 50. I'm sure I know some of them then, and I'll oh, you definitely know some of them. Say hello to them, and sorry we're not all together as we usually are. Um, I think um, to do. I think we lost it. To do a tasting, and yeah, always had a good time. So I'm Andrew Ling. I'm uh, part of a smallish, getting to be medium-sized family company. Uh, but fosters and blenders and our distillers um, we're based in Glasgow in Scotland where I'm joining you um, uh, an hour an hour earlier than I thought I mixed up the time and that's, that was part of uh, our clocks changed a few days ago that's my excuse um, <laughs> so we are you know what, it doesn't matter if you if you're the actual like you know, one step above or one step below, we all can agree on blaming Lee Hansen for everything. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, we're what's known as independent bottlers, Hunter Lane and Company, um, and we produce a bottle whiskies from all over Scotland, um, from other people's distilleries, um, some famous, some not so famous, under our various brand names. Um, the flagship brand that we bottle is Old Malt Cask, which has been going for about 22 years now. So these are these are single cask bottlings sourced from, like I said, from Speyside, from Isla, from the Lowlands, from the Highlands. Um, and I think we're trying a variety of uh, Old Malt Cask bottlings tonight. Um, and um, like I said, the other part of our business was... Uh, tomatoes are... We, we, we built um, our own distillery on Isla about uh, three, four years ago, called Ardna Ho, uh, on the north. Never heard of it. <laughs> you, you definitely have heard of it. We've heard of you anyway. I've mm -hmm. heard of you there. Um, but uh, we're situated in the northeast of the island between Banahaven and Kalila distilleries up there, overlooking the beautiful Paps of Jura, um, across the water there. So, <laughs> in Isla, um, <coughs> come and visit us when we're able to travel again, please. Um, and we'll be bottling our first official bottling of Ardna Ho probably in about two and a half or three years' time. And um, the whiskey is maturing fantastically well in the casks. And we're delighted with how it's going. It's the, actually the oldest spirit we've got. It's now two years old. Um, <laughs> a few days. Uh, it's really really coming on very well and um, yeah we think that the ninth distillery is going to hopefully have a, a bright future um, in the meantime as uh, you know we've got plenty of nice well matured 
whiskies from age six years old. Yes, we, we've already Here. covered the Fetter Cairn 11, so we're just about to jump into the Dal Ewan 12. Okay. Um, do you want to introduce this one, Andrew? Yes, absolutely. Well, that's the old malt cask uh, Dal Ewan. It is. I, I would have an example bottle um, of this, but uh, oh, Lee has one. There we go. Uh, and Dolan, Lee. That, that is entirely the wrong yeah. whiskey in every capacity. <laughs> <laughs> which one did you want? Sorry, which Adele, one was you this? and 12, Adele, you right. No, I don't have the 12 either. I don't yeah, have I know, because the only bottle I had was on hold for you. Um, yeah. Fun story on both the Federkern and the Del Ewan. Uh, we actually bought everything Lee had uh, in Alberta, and we just we <laughs> sold it all. Uh, this has been a huge success for us. Uh, so we sold uh, a couple of six-packs each of the Federkern and the Del Ewan, uh, three of the Deanston and three of the Scarabus, and... Yeah, like we basically sold right out on all of that. I could have sold more of the Del Ewan and Federkin if we had it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's been a wonderful success. But yeah, uh, Del Ewan is definitely one we don't see very often here. Uh, why don't you walk us through Del Ewan? Because as far as I'm aware, I've seen a few independents. Actually, at least one other of yours, because <laughs> I've got one last <laughs> bottle of his first editions Del Ewan left. Um, but yeah, that's the only Daluan I've got at the minute. There's no distillery bottlings over here. Do you want to start with, with why there's not really distillery bottlings and then why you chose the bottle one? Sure. So um, Daluan's a good uh, distillery to pick to discuss the benefits of independent bottling, which sounds very academic. Um, basically, it means that there, there aren't many bottlings of Daluan available. Um, the distillery is a, is a large, um, old, Victorian, I believe, distillery um, owned by Diageo, the biggest company in the whiskey industry, who do a fantastic job. But they have so many distilleries and so many brands that they can lean on or focus on every one of them. And turn it for so we actually covered this a little bit before you got on, was kind of the importance of independent bottlers and Diageo's over-reliance on their classic malts of Scotland here in North America. Okay, so yeah. I did just actually just cover this. Okay, so we had this, you would have said then that as far as Speyside goes, Diageo focus on Crag and Moor probably. As, mm -hmm. uh, although they also focus on Cardew markets and in, indeed in other markets they focus on Mortlach and um, then they they on Asia probably uh, Lendalen actually a little bit um, under the Singleton brand, uh, but Dal Yuan, which is a fantastic kind of quite quite muscular quite meaty kind of uh, or not so much meaty but quite quite full bodied kind of malt, uh, just tends to I I believe just uh, get used for their blends because it's just such good quality spirit. It's uh, it fills out a blend. It's got very nicely and you know you always need these these soldiers in the background these these distilleries that just put in the work they're not they're not fancy they're not famous they just do a good job um providing providing good quality whiskey which they have done for decades um we uh, as blenders have always enjoyed our blender a gentleman called tom aiken loves using daluan in our blended scotch whiskies that we produce it just gives that nice kind of mid, uh, you know, mid kind of palate with the kind of shoulders to the to the blend. Um, but we always rescue from the blends the best casks, the best single cask bottlings, and bottle them under Old Malt Cask or First Editions or one of our other single cask brands. Um, it's a distillery and a whiskey that deserves to be celebrated more. And um, yeah, yeah, this is a a nice. Is this, is a 12 year old one we've got here it is yes yeah uh, i have a really great question from the comments uh eric asks uh what's your relationship to the distilleries and how do you develop these relationships such as you get access to these casks yeah so uh, a lot of people think we have this romantic idea sounds nice of uh driving to the distilleries individually and um shake with the or bumping elbows maybe with the distillery managers him allowing us to choose different barrels of mature whiskey and we pick the ones we want and throw them in the back of a truck. That's unfortunately not how it happens. Maybe it, maybe it did 60 years ago in my grandfather's day, um, but then I don't think it did, to be honest. Our, our relationships are with the, the companies which own um, the distilleries, uh, the, you know, the, the, the guys, basically. Uh, 
whom we we deal and we have filling contracts and uh, buy large parcels of new spirit essentially so um, sometimes we will or, or wherever possible we will send our own casks to distilleries to be filled with new spirit and then they mature then we we bring the cask back to our own warehouse or we leave them at the distillery's warehouses and mature them up until they're ready for bottling and that can be 10 years later or 20 years later or however long so we import barrels from uh, spain from the sherry uh, industry and uh, from north america from kentucky um bourbon casks to fill. are you doing that thing that we we hear about kind of in whiskey magazines where you're paying sherry companies to actually you know make sherry that they have no intention of actually selling and then you buy their barrels off them is that is that an urban legend or is that actually what's oh, happening oh that's that's absolutely what we do and um, we work with uh three different sherry companies on that basis um one called tonleria del sur who produce quite small um for us quite small uh quarter cask um of uh with sherry and Sorry, that's my alarm going off for the for my wrong time wrong time tasting. Uh, we work with the other one. You've probably heard of Williams and Humber. Um, Williams and Humber is quite a, a, a famous old uh, sherry sherry house. Absolutely, we we carry some Williams and Humber even here still, all these years later. So yeah, so normally my brother and I will go um, to Jerez each summer and meet the. <coughs> producer and we're very well looked after and they're wonderfully hospitable and we eat lots of uh, you know nice iberico ham and uh, we're great and yeah basically we are uh, laying down sherry casks about 18 months or two years in advance of when we're going to be filling them so it's, it's quite, a, quite a commitment just on the wood side the bourbon cask much easier much easier it's just a case of essentially buying them when they're ready um, oh thank you is it the one in the sherry plenty plenty of bourbon cup oh, so, um, sherry uh, sherry is quite popular uh, or sherry sherry's not so popular i think as it used to be but sherry casks are very popular in the whiskey industry and among whiskey connoisseurs and people who enjoy drinking uh, single malt whiskey and I think the sherry industry, as the as the wine has gone down in popularity, is grateful for us turning up every year to buy um, large quantities of their cash. Cool. Um, so, uh, Lee and I did kind of discuss the Fetter can. Do you have any kind of final comments on that one before we kind of move along into the Deanston 23 here? Fetter can, yep. Fetter can is just uh, uh, another whiskey which does a lot of good work in blends. I always find Fetakane as quite a, it can be quite challenging if it's, um, you know, if, if you're not expecting it, it's got quite a robust, quite almost, um, almost in double flavor sometimes to it, quite punchy, but in the right cast, in the Fetakane, yeah, fighting single hulk, and uh, did that one go down well? well with you before? I, I I certainly enjoyed the Fetter Cairn. Lee, did you have Fetter yeah, Cairn in your glass? It, I did, I did. It was fantastic. The uh, one note on Fetter Cairn that makes it so unique is the uh, the irrigator rings that they use around the uh, the neck of the still that gives it that big, punchy, bold uh, bold character that pairs so well with uh, with Sherry Cask in particular. It's like a nice little balance there, that big meaty style Andrew was referencing, and a little bit of a sweet touch, maybe some saltiness to uh, to the mix. Yeah, it's, it's very strange if you've seen videos of that happening. It's the only distillery that does that. Uh, I don't know how they arrived at that, um, you know, a kind of production technique, but they've maintained it. And uh, yeah, it's fascinating to watch. So I have three things in the comments. Uh, first off, Lee, can you like tone down some of the background noise? Because we can really hear kind of what's going on in the background a little bit there, buddy. Apologies. That's all good. Uh, second off, we have two kind of back-to-backs here, both for Andrew. Uh, first off, how did you get Talisker? Uh, that is a tricky one for independent bottlers to get their hands on. And then related to that, uh, do you use Sautern or other dessert wine casks frequently? Um, I'll, well, I'll, I'll ask them in order. So Talisker, um, 
Tapas is uh, whiskey we're fortunate to have stocks of, and I I I can't I can't really comment any any kind of more broadly than that, other than our our relationships with uh, distillers are are you know we we built them up over time. Um, we always put our our name or indeed our photo. If you buy a bottle of Omol cask, you'll be uh, you know shocked as you drink it to see our photo appearing on the inside of the of the label as you as you get down the as the bottle empties. Um, so we're we're putting either our signature or our our very picture on each bottle. And I think distillers, when they supply us with their new spirit, um, appreciate that we stand behind every bottling that we um, that we bottle and that we offer to the world. And essentially, that we're not going to have bottle of whiskey when it's not ready, or sell one of their you know precious brands out on the market um, without doing justice to it. So, I think or I like to think that. Um, distillery owners have confidence in what we're doing and so allow us to to access some of the rarer and more desirable single malts um, on the on the wine side uh, Sotern we've we've actually filled uh, a few Sotern casks with our Nouveau spirit just to see how it will develop uh, what's the early results because I'm very interested in that as I've told you on many occasions, like Isla whiskey in a Sautern cask is literally my favorite thing. So uh, I'm very intensely interested. I haven't actually tried them yet. I'll be honest, I haven't tried them. They've been in for about 18 months. and um, You make me sad. Yeah, well, just I, an 18 month old spirit, it's, uh, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's maturing well, but uh, I want to wait until it's probably whiskey before we um, open up the cask and really take a view. The, the, we're, Obviously, checking lots of bourbon casks, lots of sherry casks, to ensure that that they are maturing properly, as we would hope, um, and they are, and they make up the backbone of what we're filling at Arnhoe. So, I'm confident that the Sautern will be pretty good as well. Uh, we've occasionally uh, finished some uh, in uh, in Sautern, and yeah, it does work quite well. Another one I like is Madeira. So Madeira finished uh, whiskies are, are quite appealing. I do like that. And in terms of other fortified wines, Port is another one. Port has a reputation, I think, for being hit and miss. But there's some fantastic Port uh, finished or Port matured Scotch single malts around. So uh, I would like to uh, I would like to fill some Port casks. I think we've only filled one or two Port pipes with um, Arnavol new make. Um, and I don't think we've ever finished a whiskey in uh, in port casks yet. Um, interesting sizes in the port cask world. Yeah, the, like the, I hear about pipes, and uh, and they're they're different sizes, right? They they hold a different volume. I think it comes back again to whether you're buying traditional kind of ex ex winery um, casks, which are the port pipes. Which are huge. They're they're bigger than sherry butts. I think they're something yeah. like six hundred liters <coughs> volume, whereas a sherry butt is five hundred or so. So they're huge. Mm -hmm. I've, I'm gonna just move us along here just a little bit, guys. Uh, just trying to keep us moving. Uh, I'm gonna go kind of Andrew Lee, Andrew here next. Uh, Andrew, we introduce us the Deanson Twenty Three, and then a question for each of you. One from the crowd, and then one from me. Okay, Deanson Twenty Three, Old Malt Cask again. So. Omo cask um, bottled at 50% alcohol. Um, was this is this uh, a refill hogshead? One. Yeah. 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 The right yeah. One. yeah. So again, Deanston. Deanston, actually, the the company which owns it promotes it quite well. The official bottlings are very good. Um, unpeated malt. Quite, quite malty. Some nice, nice fruits coming through if it's matured in the right cask. Um, really, I find Deanston, especially when it's well matured, like, to be quite a, quite a session kind of whiskey. It's dangerously drinkable, even at that 50% alcohol. And to be honest, I wouldn't add water to any of the the whiskies that we're, we're trying tonight. They're they're all reduced to uh, bottling strength, and they're all you know they're all <coughs> at their you know when they're well matured. So. 
personally, I wouldn't add water to these. Um, Deanston, beautifully drinkable, nice refill cask, allowing the, the distillate, that nice sweet, malty, uh, slightly fruity distillate to come through. And um, yeah, a nice a nice distillery to visit as well. It's just kind of the high level distillery. It's, uh, wow. just, it's, it's within the Highland region in Scotland. It's not Speyside, it's a Highland mall. Beautiful. Uh, Lee, you're always a food guy. We had a question about what snacks or what uh, foods do you traditionally pair with whiskey? Well, um, <clears throat> that's a, a really great question. It, uh, of course, depends on the type of whiskey. Um, little known secret, Smoky Isla whiskeys are absolutely amazing with caramel corn. A little bit of kettle popped uh, caramel popcorn is fantastic with smoky whiskeys. When it comes to uh, to the salty stuff, um, like a, like a Jura, I like to kind of lean in on that salt factor and go with some like olives, uh, any uh, kind of almonds, almost treating it like uh, like it was a dry sherry. Um, and then when we get into uh, a lot of people kind of lean on chocolate for Highland. Uh, I, I, I like that. It's good. But I'm more of a dark chocolate guy, which has some bitter notes to it. So it's hard to kind of make those happen. Uh, fruit, the uh, like apple custards, uh, anything that kind of pairs with those flavors that are already existing within Highland whiskeys, uh, your Christmas cake, your Christmas puddings, that those kind of notes, cinnamon, too, I really, really like. I get a lot of cinnamon notes off of this uh, this Deanston. Uh, you spend that much time in a refill hogshead, uh, you're going to pull out some really nice woody texture. And so anything that's going to balance off that texture, like a custard or um, or to see uh, actually some even salty cheeses like a uh, a manchego from uh, from Spain would go really, really well with something like this too. Something to balance the texture that I get from that amount of age. Uh, Andrew, question for me. Uh, you kept talking about, oh, when we get new make from the distilleries, are you buying these like right off the stills, like kind of 10 days old, or do you buy whiskey sometimes at two years or five years or 10 years, or is it kind of always a certain age for the most part, and did that used to be different in the past? So we try to buy uh, new make wherever possible because that allows us to, to fill it directly into the casks we want to fill. Um, but for commercial reasons, there's always swapping that goes on on in the in the industry, and this goes back um, over a hundred years, or well over a hundred years. This practice of distillers and blenders swapping casks between each other um, in order to basically create the the right kind of uh, profiles for their blends. So we do acquire casks when they're uh, older and they're mature, and then of course we'll always buy mature spirit wherever possible if it's the right kind of thing that we want. Um, I, just earlier on, I was watching a, a live kind of uh, tasting from Springbank Distillery, and they were talking about how uh, in the 80s and 90s, a lot of private individuals bought casks uh, of Springbank, um, which was a very, very wise investment indeed for whoever bought them, because uh, they're they're hugely valuable now, a cask of 25-year-old Springbank. And, Quite often, we are contacted by people who have bought Springbank casks in the past or Brooklady casks in the past. Um, <laughs> they went on a tear. <laughs> absolutely, they sold a lot, a lot of private casks to. Uh, so you're telling me never, ever actually bottle my barrel. Just wait for it to skyrocket in price. Wait, well, yes. wait, skyrocket in value, and then and then bottle it. <laughs> that that seems reasonable. Yes, we'll we'll work on that. Uh, we are just going to quickly jump in on kind of shameless promotion corner because we have uh, three whiskey or sorry three future tastings coming up one on Wednesday one on Friday and then another whiskey tasting two Fridays from now I hope you guys will bear with me just for two minutes before we get to the Scarabus I'll try to keep this fairly short if very boring for you uh, for everyone else uh, we do have a couple of events coming up uh, so coming up on Aaron what do you want these right about there Cool. So we have this Wednesday, we are doing our American style dark beers. Now, of course, porter and stout are not traditional American styles. Of course, they're from the UK. You have, uh, you know, black lagers. Those are really not American. Those are generally German. Uh, black IPA, yes, actually quite American. Um, but we wanted to kind of get American styled examples. So. 
in American style porter, American style stout, they tend to be quite a bit sweeter. If you have American style black lagers, they tend to be a good deal less smoky than their German com uh, comparisons. Uh, black IPA, I famously despise black IPA, but Annex actually made one I didn't hate, and that's why we're going to taste that one. So tasting kits are $20 as always. That's coming up this Wednesday. Should be really good fun, just some dark beers for laughs. Now, a week from today on the Friday, you may have noticed Kyle's never-ending battle with his earbuds is back because we have new ones, because our old ones decided to die three minutes before broadcast. So, uh, coming up a week from today, we have Sherry Tasting. Uh, this tasting package is $80, and oh my god, we're doing some neat stuff. Uh, we are doing a 15-year Oloroso sherry, so this is a sherry where the floor, uh, or the uh, the combination of bacteria and yeasts and fungi that kind of protect the uh, sherry from oxygen, it never really forms, or it, it forms and then immediately dies back. I mean, this is a very oxidative style of winemaking. So this is wine, effectively high-acid white wine, that sits exposed to oxygen for 15 years. Uh, and it turns this beautiful, like, chocolate mahogany brown color and is absolutely tremendous. Uh, we have a sherry made the exact opposite way. This is a fino sherry where the, uh, the floor or the, the covering forms and it ages under that floor for about two years. This is the new expression from Tio Pepe, at least in North America, called the fino rama. Uh, so this is a organic, all natural, like completely unfiltered expression of Tio Pepe. It's only like three or four dollars more than regular Tio Pepe and it's massively better. So I'm really excited to show that. Uh, and then finally, like, the reason we're all here, uh, the Marques de Pole, uh, this is a Pedro Jimenez based Amontillado at 35 years old, uh, coming from a Solera that started in 1922, literally the year this winery started. So the average age of the wine in this bottle is 35 years. There's this tiny percentage of this from 1922, 1923, and so on. So this is crazy, crazy old. Um, it's only because sherry values are so horrifically depressed right now that we can actually fit this into our upcoming wine tasting. So that's really, really fun. That's coming up on Friday. Coming up two weeks ago from now, uh, something that Lee is going to be salty about, uh, we are doing a Brook Laddie tasting. Um, uh, we actually have a barley exploration pack, one each 200 mil of the... to see all the joys of technical difficulties in their broad majesty as humanly possible. So that is what is coming up, and asynchronous, because we didn't have enough problems. Fun. Uh, so yes, uh, let us jump on to the Scarabus here. Uh, Lee, why don't you walk us through the Scarabus? Let's start with you this time. A, um, an unnamed Isla distillery, a parcel of, uh, of uh, barrels that they had, and create a new brand. And this was all about um, not only showcasing what a beautiful whiskey they're able to put out, but have something that's repeatable. That we've got uh, this amazing joy, and me on this side of the water, bringing in the single cast products has just been so much fun, always something new to sell. But sometimes you want to go back for something familiar, and with the creation of the Scarabus brand, and the, the the technology that went into making this a consistent flavor profile. When you want something repeatable in a distillery offering, you're going to strip out the heart with chill filtering, add caramel, and, uh, and bada boom, bada bing, it's going to taste like the last batch you made. With Scarabus, we've done something we, because I was there, like I'm talking like I made it, you know, I'm the owner of this stuff now. Um, what we were able to do is take a parcel, this is the toughest job in the world. Taste a number of those barrels, decide on some of the flavor profile, and then for that homogenization, that dependability that we're looking for in a brand that you can continue to go back to, what we did is use fresh virgin oak, fresh toasted bourbon barrels. We racked everything out of the original barrel into these brand new virgin oak barrels. And if you see the color of this whiskey is really reflective of that new toast and that exposure to this wonderful, wonderful uh, American uh, oak. 
the flavor because like profile. any of these whiskeys, they don't have any caramel added. These are all natural colors. So all natural, even though this yes. is about full, like three shades darker, this is still natural color. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, yeah. So as Lee's saying, that's been in the uh, virgin oak for about eighteen months, and it's mm. uh, and and it was already a reasonably uh, you know good color after uh, you know a good number of years maturation in retail casks. So yeah. Uh, it's been every drop has been in virgin oak for about a year and a half and that that caramel and that that sweet sweet kind of caramel popcorn note really comes through nicely uh, i got a couple of things i just want to get to quickly here um first off uh jeff asks why is the uh the scarabus bottle dark uh and then i'll put right on the heels of that. Uh, we ran out of the Dal Ewan and the Federcan really, really early this week. Uh, so a wonderful woman named Michelle came and picked up a bottle of the uh, Old Malt Cast Balmenic. Uh, and I sold it to her the mm -hmm. same price as, uh, I believe, the Dal Ewan. Uh, and she's asking, hey, can we talk about the thing I got? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, bottle dark on the Scarabus, uh, and then also the uh, Balmenic, I believe it was a 14 year. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk about the, the design and then I'll let Lee talk about the Valmenic. Um, I think probably knows exactly the bottling you're talking about better than I do. Because we probably shipped the last of it about a year ago from, uh, from yeah. Scotland. So the, uh, the Scarabus bottle, it's kind of uh, a, a straight answer in that it's, it was our designers that chose the every aspect of that. So it's um, yeah, it's, it's design led. If you look at all of the almost all of the Isla uh, official bottlings, um, you know, the, the peated ones, Port Charlotte, Lagavulin, um, Beaumont, Kalila. Uh, I'm just being a complete dick now, naming all the clear bottle ones I can think of. Except the only one <laughs> that doesn't have a dark bottle would be, I think, Kilholman. Um, yeah. Beaumont does at least for our market here. Beaumont is still clear. Okay, so yeah, basically we're we're fitting in. I think the designer was trying to fit in with that Isla scene, that Isla look. Um, that's 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 essentially the long and short of it. It's a shame because, as uh, Lee says, it's it's natural color. It, there's no artificial coloring in that, and it's a, a nice dark color. So it would it would look quite striking with the the liquid visible. Um, but the Scarabus design, we're we're pretty happy mm -hmm. with. The design in the bottle turned out. Um, we're, we're quite fond of it, and it's certainly been a, a huge hit for us. Um, it's, it's been quite a, quite a hit for us across almost every market we sell in, from uh, from Japan to to I think you guys over there. Anybody famously really not dig the scare of us, or just like absolutely not? Not so. <laughs> I can't think. Uh, can't think of anywhere who, which hasn't. Some some markets. Well, well, well I'll tell you where. Uh, actually, um, they, they they do take it, but it's not as much as they I would like them to. Is Taiwan, Taiwan? Oh. They um, who are one of our biggest customers as a market. They prefer their whiskey bottled at a high strength. So forty six. These are what forty threes. This 46. is 40, 46, but they like cast strength. So. Actually, it's a world exclusive. But I can reveal that we are going to be revealing uh, or releasing a cask strength uh, scarabus quite soon. Um, Save some for us. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> don't, we've got an allocation. Um, and it, so it's the same same uh, whiskey, just bottled at around fifty seven percent alcohol. So beautiful. Uh, question for uh, for Lee then, the Balmenic 14. Do you want to walk us through that just briefly? Because there's yeah, only one absolutely. person that has it, but she does deserve tasting notes. She absolutely does. There's a couple of neat things that tie in. Not, uh, it's actually owned by a Thai company, so it's kind of funny, a Taiwan company called uh, Imber House. That uh, It's just a, a weird coincidence that we just happened to bring that up. Uh, they're not producing any single malt. If you go to a Balmenac website, you'll actually be taken, ported over to the uh, Carowin Gin. So the only way to get a Balmenac right now is from uh, from an IB, from an independent bottler. You cannot get this otherwise. So a beautiful 14-year-old spirit uh, from the space side, 
I believe it's a refill hogshead, if I if I remember it correctly, because I don't have it in front of me. Uh, another neat note about uh, this is actually one of the earliest distilleries. This uh, opened hung a shingle in 1824 as a result of the 1823 Excise Act. Uh, used to be part of the Johnny Walker blend. It's changed hands a number of times, but now that it's owned by Ember House, they've uh, decided to wait a bit before releasing any any single malt. They're they're currently actively storing barrels, but they're not releasing any. So. So kind of a secret uh, secret weapon in the in the arsenal to pull something out that when I'm looking at price lists that Andrew uh, sends me I look at okay well Lafroy I'm gonna buy that for sure uh, Eddie McCallan I can't afford that uh, Paul Manek yeah I'll bring some and of that and you don't want that McCallan's weeks. terrible <laughs> I, d- I don't mind the uh, the revenue that McAllen can generate uh, right. on the on the right occasion on the right occasion, but yeah, it is it is kind of a fun little secret weapon and just a very space side style, not uh, not over the top with any phenolic or gassy kind of characters. Um, I know I, if I remember, there's a real good kind of a great grainy texture. You really get that cereal cream on the palate, and then just a little bit of a salty spritz to finish it off. I I, I like the whiskey a lot, but it's been some time since I finished my bottle. Beautiful. Question for Andrew from uh, Lee's old friend, Mark Whitehead. Um, Andrew, how would you describe the character of the Ardenaho spirit in relation to uh, the rest of the Isla malts? <clears throat> okay, so uh, the Ardenaho spirit is, first of all, we use malt which is peated to around 40 ppm, 40 parts per million of peat. Um, and we get that from the Port Ellen maltings, um, Diageo owned Port Ellen maltings. They use, usually use Isla. Malt. So it's got that very distinctly Isla peat smoke in it straight away, uh, which comes through in the spirit. We uh, we get when we um, do the mashing, we get quite a clear, quite clear um, wort, as it's called the this the liquid. They don't mash it too hard, so you're you're getting quite a, a sweet clear wort, and then um, that translates after fermentation uh, in the wooden washbacks for around 70 75 hours into quite a quite a sweet and fruity albeit um, peaty wash which we then distill and crucially at um, Ardenhoe we're the only ones on the island which do this we have um, worm tub condensers so these worm tub condensers mm-hmm. they were very difficult very expensive to produce and install um, and in fact I'm not sure that the company that did them had had actually manufactured any from scratch before, um, but they, they did it and they, they work fantastically. So these worm tub condensers, without getting too technical, essentially allow a, a slower condensation of the of the vapor into spirit, which we believe adds a certain complexity and a weightiness to the spirit. So when we when we end up with the spirit. It's got a lovely creamy texture. There's a nice complexity to it. There's a sweet fruitiness, and there's a uh, there's a obviously the Isla Peat running right through it. Um, our our master distiller at the time who helped us launch or bring in the the spirit the first ever time was the famous Jim McCune. Um, so there may be an element of his signature style in there if you can identify a signature style, but. Um, we believe Arno, as as it stands, is is, is individual, um, but very much uh, an Isla single malt. Well, we have a grand conspiracy theory here cooking in the comments about light struck PD whiskies. Does the uh, does the color of the bottle actually impact uh, PD whiskies at all? Like, are you deliberately ever using darkened glass to prevent the uh, the light from breaking down the peat content or the PD flavors in the whiskey? And yes, I, I'm aware that tubes are a thing. Lee. Yes, uh, I'm just curious that. Uh, that I, I, that was my first thought when I read the question too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously tubes are a thing. Virtually every single malt comes in a box. Um, but yeah, it, is there a real reason why somebody, if they had, you know, say, uh, you know, an old malt cask talisker on the shelf and it's clear glass, where they would want to keep it in the box rather than uh, using dark glass, for example? No, as, as far as we're concerned, no. Um, it's never entered our, our thinking, to be quite honest. And I think uh, anyway, our bottles tend to get emptied so quickly that that wouldn't be a concern. <laughs> Ah, that's too good. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so, I have a question of my own. Um, so, of course, we, we got the announcement, uh, I can't remember if it was last year or a year before, uh, Diageo, of course, announced they were reopening Port Ellen. Mm -hmm. uh, is there just a hubbub of activity around Port Ellen? And are you actually out of all your kind of pre-closure Port Ellen casks? Okay, so, uh, yeah, Diageo are, are reopening Port Ellen, uh, but because of what's happened over the last year, I think their schedule's been been delayed quite considerably. Um, so I don't know, I, I don't have any inside knowledge at all, but um, I don't know when it's going to be open. Uh, that's the first thing. I'm looking forward to seeing it open again because, um, you know, I think it'll be time for the actual job building, uh, rebuilding Port Ellen. And Port Ellen is a distillery we're quite fond of as a family. Um, my dad always tells me that it was my grandfather's which was why he loaded up on it um, when it was closing, um, which was quite fortunate for us. Um, brings me on to the second thing. We still still support of, of uh, Fort Ellen. Apparently Lee is experiencing an earthquake at the moment, so... Going back. Has the house stopped shaking, Lee? Are, are we all good? <coughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we've got some some nice stocks of Port Ellen still, and in fact, we're going to be um, releasing a very special Port Ellen um, probably towards the beginning of next year, um, which will be quite quite special with a, a nice presentation. And I assume that'll be in the author series. Um, no, actually, it's a new presentation, uh, a brand new presentation, which uh, we've essentially reserved exclusively for our Port Ellen bottlings. So uh, we'll make sure that Lee gets an allocation of that as well. And hopefully I'll be able to come and taste it with you in person um, sometime next year. I can't wait to one. sell my car to buy one, yes. Yeah. Uh, so actually, if you, I mean, I, I know that you don't live on Isla, but I imagine you're there fairly frequently. Is, is like when I went, when I was last in Port Ellen, which was, you know, in 2008, um, like the Port Ellen maltings, while they looked like they were operative, it was a bit of a ghost town with all these, you know, restarting plans. Is it, is it busier? Is there a whole bunch of like construction equipment all over the place? Or does it really look just much the same as always? And it's much more of a restart in theory than in practice. Uh, they haven't, as far as I'm aware, begun construction yet. I think they, they cleared the site and the area that where the distillery used to be, which is more or less where they're rebuilding the the new one, um, that, that's I think fenced off and they've cleared some rubble and some debris, but it's by no means a, a hubbub of construction yet. Um, hopefully we've got that to look forward to in, in the next year. But yeah, certainly um, there's a lot of interest in Isla at the moment and, uh, and we're very glad and very happy to be to be part of it and to be welcoming so many visitors in in its first year open we welcomed that to Ardenhoe uh, about 25,000 visitors um which be given that everyone has to get to Isla first is uh you know, not the easiest it's an adventure yeah exactly especially if it's if the weather's not so great and the planes cancelled or the or the ferries um delayed or cancelled so um, 25,000 visitors was quite a nice start. Um, yeah, so, so we, we feel we're in a good place and look forward to Isla you know, expanding and growing um, as more and more people appreciate the, the, the smoky, traditionally Isla flavor. I've just, maybe Isla has changed dramatically in the last 12 years, but where the heck do you put 2,000 visitors a month on Isla? There's not that many hotel rooms or yeah. bathrooms or restaurant seats or anything. Like, it's it's a small, very laid-back place unless it's changed dramatically. Well, it's, it's, even, it's even worse than that in terms of a you know, capacity problem because it's not 2,000 visitors a month. It's uh, very few visitors for January, February, March, and then April it starts to pick up. And then May it explodes because there's the Isla Whiskey Festival. Um, and I think the, the population of the island just about quadruples overnight, and um, and yeah, that can be that can be. You, you want to have booked your hotel room about a year in advance. Um, the the, uh, the ferry um, staff will ask you as you're getting onto the ferry, do you have accommodation? And if you basically if you can't 
convince them that you know where you're going, they'll turn you around and not let you on the boat. <laughs> they don't want people wow. leaping in the streets um, because you know there's there's literally no hotel rooms available. Um, so it's a nice influx of of uh, ash essentially to the tourist economy every springtime, and then that lasts throughout the summer and then dies off um, around kind of September October. Uh, I worry that my Isla experience when I was there kind of early March 2008 where I felt like basically the only non-local on the whole island, I feel like that's an experience I'll never really get again. I think Isla's gone a little too mainstream for me to be able to do that again. Yeah, I mean I've been going to Isla since the kind of late 80s and uh, the thing that um, that is most remarkable for me, apart from the fact that there's many more tourists and visitor centres now. Uh, the smell of peat isn't as prevalent now as it used to be. It seemed that everybody had a peat fire burning um, instead of central heating back in the day. So if you'd go in the 90s to Port Charlotte or um, Port Ellen, there would be this heavy smell of peat hanging in the air, uh, peat smoke. And you don't really get that anymore. So that by now, when you when you do smell it, it's uh, uh, a nice surprise. Um, but back then, it was, it was everywhere. Um, and for, the, for those at home who are only familiar with Port Charlotte or Port Ellen as distilleries, they're also, well, one's a town, one's generously described as a hamlet. So there's not much <laughs> to Port Charlotte, really. Uh, but yeah, these, these are real places. I mean, Port Charlotte's the, the, the nice hotel, the super shady bar, and I, I guess, does, does Brookline actually have their like Port Charlotte Visitor Center up yet? I don't think they no. do, but no. no. Um, Brookline had planned to rebuild. This was going back 20 years, they had planned to rebuild the distillery which was in Port Charlotte and which is still there. And they use it as a warehouse, some of the buildings, but uh, they've certainly shelved their plans to build another distillery um, there. Uh, but it's a, it's a nice hamlet, nice little fishing village, I suppose, um, with a nice hotel. Yeah, there's a few nice hotels on, on Isla. Um, there really are, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions from anyone? Because uh, actually, I had one from Nicole just a second ago. Um, in terms of like how whiskey is made, would a Scotch from say 1825 uh, taste wildly different from one made today? And if so, why so? Well, the the technique's more or less the same. I think probably the things that have changed the most would be um, the the stills not being direct fired anymore. They would historically have been you know, pretty basic with uh, coal or, or some kind of fuel put underneath them and set a light and, and then it you know, burned that way. Now it's more controlled than that. Um, they, and worm tub condensers, which uh, kind of went out of fashion in the, I think in the mid part of the, the last century, uh, which we still use, but most distilleries don't use. But I think broadly speaking, the flavor profiles quite comparable because I've, I've had whiskies that were distilled in the 19 the, the 19th century so the 1800s and bottled in the late 1800s and they're still recognizably scotch whiskey um, and if the seal on the bottle's been tight and the alcohol has been kept um, up to the right strength then you could you, you could be you could believe that it was a modern whiskey um, in some instances so sure there's been some variation but it's not not wild Lee, I saw you raise your hand. Yeah. You had something to contribute to that? Yeah, I had an understanding that um, the use of peat uh, specifically to uh, to toast the malt was not as uh, uh, c was more common on in Highland and in Speyside whiskies, much more common than it, than it is now. That they didn't have uh, electricity to toast the uh, the malt and have that cleaner, fresher style, they would actually use the fuel source at hand, uh, which would be burning the peat logs. And that's why Isla has its distinction of being smoky because they didn't actually get electricity until the 50s. And by then it was a thing. <laughs> so my understanding is that it, the older styles of, uh, of whiskey from Speyside, from the Highlands, there would be much more uh, peat smoke interspersed with, uh, within, those, uh, within those regions. Yeah, I think maybe maybe yeah, um, the older style of, of Highland was something like Ardmore or Highland Park. Yeah, got that 
element of peatiness. I think maybe Ben Romach as well. Um, not entirely sure. I think that's very lightly peated. Mm-hmm. And uh, whereas now most of the Highland and space sites are unpeated completely. Um, of course, Isla still the the, the peat on Isla um, is different. It's got that phenolic medicinal quality. Yeah, yeah. Of whiskey like Ardmore or um, or even probably Highland Park doesn't have quite that medicinal um, salinity that comes from the peat bogs having been washed by entries of seawater and right. thrown onto them. Um, that's that's the difference. But yeah, it's a good point, Lee. I, I'm kind of amazed that Isla has electricity. I was there in 2008 <laughs> like, when I got my hotel room. They gave me a coal <laughs> shuttle like to go to my room. It's like, don't forget to top up your fire. It's like, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much. I genuinely have no idea what to do with this. Uh, I was a terrible tourist. Uh, Mark had a question. This is actually one I didn't think of. Uh, apparently it was Tanji's question, actually. Uh, is there one Hi, giant warehouse where you store all of the uh, Hunter Lang whiskeys, or uh, do you store them kind of all over the place? Yep, good question. We, uh, we've we got one big, uh, well, two kind of, one big and one small warehouse in Glasgow, where uh, the big one, we mature things for a long time, uh, and the small one, we, we just take the barrels as they're about to be bottled. Um, they, but most of our stock still is kept at the distilleries or at the third party warehouses, um, essentially for logistical reasons, because if we uh, fill casks at a distillery and they allow us to keep them there, then it saves us having to uh, basically bring them down and go to the work of s- stacking them into our warehouse. Uh, so. Ultimately, we've got casks around about 70 locations around Scotland. Beautiful. Um, I'm going to ask a couple questions back to back here. The first one's just a pure curiosity on my part. Um, Lee, Andrew, what do we have coming to us? Do we have another uh, Hunter Lang shipment arriving before Christmas, or is what we got what we got? Oh, God, no. We've got, uh, we've got a pile visible from space that has been stuck in Montreal for a month. Um, oh, no. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, we've got, uh, we're actually doing a, a bit of a mini relaunch on uh, on the Hepburn's Choice brand. So we've got a 46% alcohol brand, too, uh, to share with you guys. Some younger ages, some really fun uh, uh, wine treatment casks that are coming along that. I've got uh, probably six or seven old ball casks. I was I was saying to Andrew the other day that his dad must have gone on a buying spree 23 years ago because we've got some uh, some more uh, Ben Nevis 23 year old, we've got some Buna Haven 23 year old coming uh, a um, Ben Riek 23 and you know that's one of the real fun little collectors given the changes that Ben Riek has gone through in uh, in the last little while uh, I've got some old and rare you know in this uh, in these troubled times you would think that there would be less of a thirst for the um, higher end shall we say you say that so smarmly knowing i've pre-orders for three of the damn things so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just going to jump over I'm to andrew just for a sec here lee yeah. uh lee mentioned kind of like a soft relaunch of the hepburn's choice now i haven't had a hepburn's choice here in a little while uh, it seems like it was kind of off the market for a little while um what what's the what's the new branding on hepburn's choice about uh why is it back and what should we expect that's new and different from them andrew okay so the uh the, the Hepper's Choice rebrand is completely different in presentation. It's quite bright, quite kind of funky in, in its style, and that reflects where we're taking the uh, whiskey. Lee said we're doing quite a lot of fun kind of wine finishes to the casks. Quite a lot of um, uh, actual, actually, virgin oak uh, as well in some of these Space Island and Highland and Isla whiskies. And um, we're we're pretty happy with uh, the the first batch. The, the first batch sold out very quickly. I think we did about twenty different Hepper's Choice bottlings, and, um, and we just can't keep them in stock. That's really good introductory uh, bottlings to you know the single cask market. Um, and again, great great kind of everyday session whiskies. Uh, and I know Lee's chosen some of the best ones. As always, nice. new packaging as well, or the same packaging we had before. New, pack- new packaging. It's um, completely new. Completely new. 
And actually, Beautiful. while I've got you on, on the spot, Andrew, uh, something I wanted to clear up. When we see bourbon uh, cask now on those, we're talking about bourbon cask finish. We're talking about virgin oak then. No, no. So okay. bourbon cask, which is a first fill, um, so in other words, being taken from a refill uh, hogshead, mm -hmm. put into a, a bourbon barrel probably for about two years just to give that little cake of uh, caramel vanilla sweetness to it Corn. uh yeah and then and then some are uh, virgin actual okay virgin. fantastic fantastic you mentioned i just want to give you a heads up you you mentioned the ben nevis 23 year old that that's the old malt cask uh, <coughs> yeah yeah see that's uh that that sold out almost instantly and i've been getting calls from all over the world about it um so make sure uh cal that you get a a case or two of that. Hey, how much do you got of that coming, buddy? Uh, old pal, old John. Old pal, I've got uh, I've got one extra one I can part with uh, beyond what I'll we chatted about the other day. Okay, fantastic news. Thank okay. you, Andrew. You got a call from I, unless I already said I'd take two, I'll, instead Kate, I'll take three. Uh, <laughs> I got a call from a market. I, we've never even I won't mention the country, but I'd never even uh, approached them before, and we got a call via middleman looking for some cases, uh, but sold out anyway but uh yeah enjoy that We're excited. we will yeah it's gonna be really a lot of fun uh it's been an interesting year for scott shipments i mean a lot of the a lot of things i ordered in february are only getting here like next week or the week after it's been a very yeah. uh yeah. interesting old ride here but we're starting to get some really neat stuff now i mean we're we're into a scotch chasing series we've got you gentlemen tonight and then we're gonna try and do four or five more before christmas and yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, the shelves look but really well stocked behind you. That's an illusion. There's some double facings back there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I think we'll call that an evening. Thank you both so, so much. I really appreciate you doing this. Oh, thank you. It's always great to see you. And, uh, you know, hopefully next time we'll be in person. I hope that too. But don't, uh, don't be surprised if I hit you up for another digital one. Yeah, I'll be happy to do it. Yeah, I'll make sure I'm on time as well. <laughs> That's alright, just, you know, two pots of coffee because it's very, very late. <laughs> alright, thanks guys, all the best. Alright. Thanks, Good Kyle. night, gentlemen. That's fantastic, great work. Thank you both very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Alright, so huge thanks to Lee Hansen and Andrew Lang for joining us tonight. This was a lot of fun. Uh, and thank you to all of you for joining us as well. Um, I apologize for any...